Hello. In this lecture, I'll be discussing dual heuristic programming, DHP. And for some purposes, this is the real meat. We've gotten to the real stuff. When I talk about DHP today, I'm going to start out by explaining why DHP. In the last two weeks, we learned a lot about HDP. And a lot of people would say, HDP, that's already complicated enough. You can already prove universal convergence theorems. It will eventually get to the right answer. It is a universal intelligence system if you hook it up to do reinforcement learning. So why DHP? Why is it essential? So the first half, I'm going to talk about why DHP and some applications which demonstrate the important value of DHP in real engineering. And then I'm going to get into the hard part, which is the mathematics of DHP and how to implement it. A lot of what we learned from HDP applies to DHP as well. So we're going to build on that foundation. I'm going to focus on the new part when we get to the mathematics. But first, why do we need DHP? So I'm going to start out with one motivating slide, nice little color picture. This is what I showed long ago to Andy Bartow, one of the founders of reinforcement learning in computer science. We had a joint workshop in 1988 on neural networks for control, bringing together both of these communities. And when Bartow saw the HDP flowchart, for the first time, he looked at it and he said, wait a minute, when you do this, you're not really using your estimate of J. You're only using the derivatives. You use the derivatives to train your action network, and you use your derivatives down here for your decisions. So if you don't really use the J, why don't you just output the derivatives directly? Why don't you build a network which outputs the things you use? If you want high accuracy in this kind of situation, don't you want to put your forecasting resources into computing the things that you use that determine the quality of your results? So that's one possible motivator. In the next slide, I'm going to talk about a whole lot of other motivators, starting from the informal to the mathematical. On an informal level, we start with Bartos' comment. But earlier than that, when I developed that HDP, Intelligent System Design, I was very troubled. It didn't seem realistic in some ways. Is it really true that every time we face a small decision in life, a little use of I decision we have to make, do we always refer it directly back to our global sense of happiness, J and U? When we think about our emotions, are our emotions all, I am happy, I am not happy? Is that the whole spectrum of human emotions? It, it doesn't seem powerful enough. Also, if you want to train a critic to learn a lot of information about the world, don't you need rich feedback? If you want to build an intelligent system which learns a lot of things, doesn't it need rich feedback? And if all of you have, if all you have is one J signal, that's like being in a school where there are a million students and one teacher, and all you get is that one person. It's hard to believe you can learn a whole lot of different subjects that way. It's hard to believe you can build a complex intelligent system when the feedback is just one scale or number like J. With DHP, we have a rich vector of feedback. We have values placed on every component of the vector x. Another thing that's interesting is economics. When I was an undergraduate, I knew I was interested in this field before there were any classes in the field. And I had to ask, where can I learn something about the mathematics of what it takes to build distributed intelligent systems with many little independent processors like neurons, that can learn collectively an optimal decision on, over time. What subject would teach that kind of mathematics? 
And the subject I picked was economics, because a lot of economics is interested in how do you organize a complex system which collectively can make intelligent decisions. And economists found out long ago you need price vectors. You need lambdas, which are just like these lambdas. You need values on individual variables. And Freud used to talk about emotional charge on specific objects. You don't just feel good or bad. You feel, I hate that, I'm scared of that, I love that, hey, that's nice. That's kind of the, the rich tapestry of human emotion, the way Freud saw it. So these are all reasons why a powerful or realistic intelligence system maybe should use lambda instead of just j. More precisely, even though HTP will converge to the right answer eventually, if you have a system that can learn faster and more effectively, in finite time it should be able to perform better. Um, so let me give you another intuitive example of why you might want this kind of system. Um, consider a simple decision you might face in ordinary life. You've got to choose between going to bus stop A or bus stop B. That's actually a higher level than what people deal with in control theory, where you're controlling low-level movements sometimes. When you're trying to make a decision about A versus B, do you really want to ask yourself every day when you're going to the bus, how does this bus stop affect the probability of humans surviving on Earth? How does this bus stop affect the probability of humans surviving on Earth? Or of me finding a job? You don't want to think directly all the way from the little decision to the cosmic global scalar like JSTAR. You want to have other intermediate values with values on them, like lambda. You place a certain intermediate value for now on getting to work on time or not upsetting your stomach when you run for the bus. So common sense says it's more realistic and more workable to have a whole vector of values on different variables and, and these values change with time of course but j is a function of time too, it's a function of, of x and lambda is a function of x. Now formally in the Handbook of Intelligent Control, which is up on the web, in Chapter 13, there's a section called Persistence of Excitation. Persistence of Excitation is one of the things people worry about in control theory when they worry how well your controller will work over time, when things get slow, when information is not always available. And it seems very clear to me from that analysis that you do expect DHP to work better than the simpler scalar methods. Now, let me put in a, a caveat here. DHP does require that the derivatives exist. When you have continuous variables and you have derivatives, it's important to use them. What happens when you don't have derivatives? Well, later on I'll talk about a more general method yet. Beyond DHP, there's something called globalized DHP, which formally lets you use derivatives for the continuous variables, and it lets you avoid using them for the discrete variables. That sounds like the best of all worlds, but it's a bit more complicated than DHP. Many engineering applications, DHP is all you need, but there are some applications where people have moved to special cases of GDHP, the more general method. In the long term, when people face lots and lots of continuous, sorry, discrete variables, you get into really serious problems where you might need to approximate them in a fuzzy way, and then you wind up coming back to continuous variable methods with a fuzzy approximation. That may turn out to be the best way to deal with really complex problems with discrete variables, but that's a subject for future research. Right now, a lot of what we need is to have good versions of DHP, GDHP, HDP, related methods in packages which people find it convenient to use, well-tuned with research to make them as robust and capable as possible, and that, that's a foundation to build some of these future possible capabilities. Let me finally say the benefits of DHP here are not just in theory. 
there is, have been some very substantial applications. In fact, just after I finished these slides, I saw a new application of DHP in the electric power field, which I won't talk about today. I only have time to talk about three or four really big classic applications, but there are a whole lot more appearing here and there. And I'll talk first about work by Balakrishnan, work by Vania Gamorthy, Wunsch, and Harley back in 1994, but they have lots of new applications, work by Ferrari and Stengel, and by Wunsch, Prokhorov, and Santiago. So first, Balakrishnan. And these are some slides I've shown around the world. A lot of people wonder, how do I dare talk about something so sensitive? But in fact, it's already been published. The world knows about it already. Those parts of the world that care about it. Many years ago, I funded a professor, S. N. Balakrishnan, in Missouri, Rala, who is still very active today in the aerospace community, to use DHP to solve a problem that thousands of other people had worked on. It's the problem called hit-to-kill missile interception. And he took existing models of how your interceptor would work and how a target would work, and he showed that if you use DHP to solve that nonlinear control problem, to minimize the error in hit-to-kill, you can reduce the error by about an order of magnitude. And of course I was pretty excited when he came up with that result. He publishes most of this work in places like the AIAA, American Institute for Aeronautics and Astronautics. They have a guidance, navigation, and control conference, but then there are other things and their papers which aren't published that I know of. What really excited me was after he did this exciting initial work using DHP, there were people in the Missile Defense Administration who became very interested. There was a time when people used to say, we know how to knock down incoming missiles. We have a wonderful Patriot missile. And there were headlines and press, but the people who studied it said it didn't really work. It really only worked 1% of the time. So if somebody sends 100 missiles to try to kill you, 99 will hit you. It doesn't really change things. You don't even save a lot of lives. And I'm not interested in aggressive warfare, but saving lives seems important to me. If people ever do send a missile to Washington, D.C., I would like the missile defense systems to work well, because the main effect would be to keep people alive. That would be the main effect of highly accurate missile interception. So I was very happy when the Ballistic Missile Defense Administration was very upset about those low hit rates, and they commissioned a special study by a person named Cottrell of Nichols Research to compare all of the hundreds of methods people had developed for this problem and do a kind of shoot-off, a really tough, objective benchmark to see which was the best. Among the methods they tested were their own methods, which were pretty good, and they hoped they would be the best. But these were honest people. And in their test, they found like four winners from the hundreds of candidates, and one of them was Balakrishna. They gave tougher tests to all four, and consistently, DHP did an order of magnitude better. Just a couple of years ago, when I was working in the office of Senator Specter on the Senate Appropriations Committee for Defense, we, was in, we were invited to a meeting on the current status of missile defense technology at the Marshall Institute. That's about the number one place making policy in that area. And in that meeting, there were people from Lockheed, and they all said, yes, guys, it used to be missile defense was BS. You wouldn't really get that capability. But now, the problem has been solved. Thanks to a breakthrough, now we can really do it more than 90% of the time. And I remember smiling when they said, there's this guy you might not have heard of. His name is Balakrishnan. And, and we at MIT and Lockheed, it's a bit of a struggle to understand these problems. It's not the kind of control theory they taught us when we went to school. But it works. We've proven it. And with you know, orders of magnitude, improvement in accuracy, we really can create effective defense against ballistic missiles. And it's just a matter of how much we deploy it. The problem has been solved, they told me, thanks to this guy, and they asked if I'd ever heard of him. 
which was fun. It has been widely published, variations in AIAA journals. In fact, many years ago, Balakrishnan was invited to give a big plenary talk in a place called Harbin in China. And if you know anything about Harbin, you know, of course the Chinese know all about this. There's no sense pretending that this basic idea could be kept secret. I'm sure there are details I don't know, but the basic success is now very well established, and a lot of people are following up. Balakrishnan has a paper in one of the important ADP books, The Handbook of Learning and Adaptive Dynamic Programming, from IEEE Wiley, and it's he also has some more recent work on something called the Single Network Adaptive Critic, where he still uses DHP to train the critic. It's the same DHP for the critic, but he gets rid of the action network. So he combines the DHP critic, what I'm going to teach you how to do, with a slightly different kind of action network. Bala also has a paper out on a broom balancer, which is kind of entertaining. Years ago, I spoke to some aerospace people who looked at the demonstrations of reinforcement learning that are up on the web from computer science. And there's a little broom balancer where after 2,000 crashes it finally learns and it balances the broom. And I still remember the aerospace guy who said, God, if our airplane had to crash 2,000 times before it learned control, that is not good for our applications. But Bala used a DHP controller Admittedly, he was trying to minimize error in balancing instead of just looking at crashes, and he was able to balance it without any crashes. And that makes a big difference when you can learn fast enough that you do not crash during the process of learning. So Bala's paper on broom balancing is interesting. I think there's more to be done there, and that's a nice academic research project, uh, and it shows something important to the real world. One more example which I think is extremely important. It hasn't been as widely deployed. Way back in 1999, there was a best paper award at a neural network conference for a real scale, laboratory scale demonstration of DHP controlling a turbo generator. Now, we have turbo generators out there in the world, lots of them. In electric power, they're automatic gain controllers for every turbo generator out there pretty much thousands of them and they all try to control to get the right voltage frequency and phase in the generator keep everything in sync but they have problems sometimes when there's a disturbance in the line and they crash as part of their work Harley, Venega, Morthy and Wunsch did an incredibly thorough review and evaluation of all the existing methods now used in the real world to control turbo generators. And they are pretty sophisticated in terms of traditional control theory. And they have been designed to work well by people who want them to work well. But at a certain level of disturbance they break down. In simulations these guys tried adaptive control, neural network adaptive control, a variety of other methods and ADP was roughly about the same as the adaptive control in simulations. But as soon as they hit real laboratory scale, real hardware, the simulations stopped working so well. Because all of the theoretical properties which make adaptive control work well sometimes, the real world was a little nastier. But DHP still worked in the real world. And in their paper they showed that DHP controller could withstand all kinds of disturbances three times as large as what anything else could withstand. So if you're in an earthquake zone and there's a big shock in the grid and you don't want your generators to come down, it's nice to have a controller that can withstand disturbances three times as large, a controller you could push closer to the stability margins. In fact, these guys have interesting international collaborations. They um, have recently been working with New Zealand, which has an earthquake zone. So this is very serious stuff. It hasn't moved as fast as uh, the missile interception, but technically it's important. And the other thing is, these folks have a whole lot of very, very important follow-on work developing ever more interesting applications. They have got a few things working on the U.S. grid, 
but it's harder to get things on the U.S. grid than in the international grid. And they have some new things coming down in the pipe that are of larger importance, which I'll talk to in a later part of the course. So now let me mention just another couple of other interesting applications of, of ADP, DHP, which strike me as important. One is by Stengel and Ferrari, who have a paper in the book by C et al. that I just cited. You may remember that Stengel is the author of one of the two best, widely respected textbooks on optimal control. So Stengel is one of the really important leaders in modern control theory in the field of optimal control. He really knows that stuff. What's more, he's author, also author of a major textbook on aerospace control and aerospace problems in particular. Now it intrigues me that Bryson, the first author of the other big book on optimal control, was also very big in aerospace control. Aerospace has been a major point of deployment for optimal control because optimal control, optimal performance is very important in aerospace. Sylvia and Stengel have a paper several years old where they prove that DHP gives you better performance, something like 5% less fuel use but other good measures of performance, what you can do in maneuvers, for high performance aircraft maneuvers beyond what was available from the very best control algorithms available for high-speed aircraft before that time. And it's especially interesting because Stengel knows what the very best were. This is not like somebody from a high school doing a poor implementation of the status quo. This is one of the leaders of the status quo did a systematic comparison against the DHP controller and showed a significant improvement in performance. And what's even more exciting there's a, an improvement in performance in being able to save an airplane when it's damaged. And in civilian aviation and in warfare, if you can reduce damage by a factor of two, if, or if you can reduce loss of airplanes after damage by a factor of two, that's hugely important. And there's a lot of potential to benefit the civilian and the military sector. Frankly, it hasn't been fully deployed yet, but it's been proven. And there has been a major program in reconfigurable flight control, which resulted from this work and from some earlier work using simpler forms of ADP, which didn't work as well, but worked a lot better than existing methods. The real challenge here, there are lots of control algorithms which will stabilize your airplane if it's not damaged. But the minute you're damaged, you're in a realm of uncertainty and of unknown where being able to learn quickly on the fly is critical. You have no proof that you're going to be able to recover the airplane because most of the time you don't. With existing methods that are proven stable, 98% of the time you're dead. So the, the game there is a game of probabilities. Stochastic optimization maximizes your probability of survival if you do it right. So to me that's exciting. Another important paper not so exciting in a real-world point of view, but from a theoretical point of view, very interesting, is a paper by Prokhorov, Santiago, and Wunsch in Neural Networks 1995, which I highly recommend to all of you as students, because you don't need to know how airplanes work. They have several challenge control problems that we developed really in the late 1980s simple but difficult control problems where modern control has had a very difficult time finding solutions. In these benchmark control problems, these guys were able to show that DHP substantially outperformed HDP and it substantially outperformed the other methods available with one exception. In the problems they saw, it was approximately equal to one other neural network method called backpropagation through time, BTT, as a control method. Turns out that's a method I developed using the chain rule for ordered derivatives. And I certainly don't want to sell it short. It's very useful in many problems, but it does have a couple of limitations. There are times when you can combine it together with ADP to get the best results. 
But in essence, backpropagation through time does not account for stochastic factors. It is a good method for multi-stage deterministic optimization, and in practice it works in noisy problems more than you might expect. It can even be made stochastic by marrying it with differential dynamic programming. But even then, it can't scale to large noisy problems. It's not brain-like. But it is something that you want in your software package. Just for honesty, for simplicity, when you're running ADP, it's good to have this one there, too, at the same time. And it also has important real-world successes. Uh, for example, Prokhorov has also done work using BTT. When he was at Ford, there were major successes in Toyota. He's using it with a controller for the Prius Hybrid, improving MPG 15%. That's a pretty good success. And uh, so, so that is a useful method to have there, too. For newer applications, well, I mentioned the book by Lewis and Liu. I've seen some recent work by Fairbank, even Kamala Sadan, some people in China. There's a lot of other recent work, but these are interesting examples. So now I've described intuitively why we want DHP, why it is the cutting edge, why it is the most important single method for you to learn. But I haven't yet told you how to do it, and that's a fairly complicated story. So how do we do dual heuristic programming? In a sense, it's just one new equation. To really understand HDP, you need to understand the Bellman equation. With DHP, you need to understand another equation. As I look back over the history, I think maybe I should have written 20 equations to make it clear to people. There's plenty of room for other people to do that. So on the next slide, I'm going to show you the Bellman equation, and I'm going to show you one more equation, which is the foundation of DHP. There is a question, what do we call this equation? I've had friends who have said you should call it the stochastic Pontryagin equation. Let me explain why that is. The Bellman equation, some people call it the Hamilton-Jacobi-Bellman equation. Some people say, no, we'll look at the continuous time version and call that the Hamilton-Jacobi-Bellman equation. You'll see this term around a lot, but a lot of times people talk about Hamilton-Jacobi-Bellman equation harking back to the old equation developed by Hamilton and Jacobi in physics, where they use the letter S instead of the letter J or V. The Hamilton-Jacobi equation was for optimization in the deterministic case and they used one single action variable called S to make the optimal decision. There was a Russian mathematician called Pontryagin or a control theorist, I don't know how you would label him, an important researcher, developed something called the Pontryagin equation which is like the Hamilton-Jacobi equation you use it for optimization in a continuous variable situation with continuous variables and continuous time. But instead of being based on a scalar variable S, it is based on lambda, which is basically the gradient of S. And the Pontryagin equation is like the derivative of the Hamilton-Jacobi equation. So now what happens if we take the derivative of the Bellman equation to come up with a stochastic version of the Pontryagin equation so that we can calculate the values lambda in the stochastic case. So this is like a stochastic generalization of the Pontryagin equation. Since I came up with this equation, maybe my name should be on it, whatever. Uh, it was published for the first time in the Handbook of Intelligent Control, Chapter 13. And what it's based on, the derivation there is very simple. This deserves more complete math, but really the simple version works. You take the Bellman equation and you differentiate it. 
and you differentiate it using the chain rule. You better know the chain rule very well. And in my head, I was thinking about the chain rule for ordered derivatives, because even though I'm writing these like ordinary derivatives, I know the calculations are correct, because what I'm really applying is the chain rule for ordered derivatives, because what we really need to calculate is what is the impact of a change in actions at time t through a complex system on an outcome j. That's a very complex kind of partial derivative. But in the handbook, I just wrote it down as if the ordinary chain rule were good enough, and people nod their heads and say, oh yeah, you use the chain rule correctly. But more rigorously, I should have invoked the chain rule for ordered derivatives, because that's what these really are. And if you look at the equation in the handbook, it looks pretty scary. But, so you, you need to look at it on the slide or in the handbook. But it says lambda sub i is equal to this derivative plus this derivative. And here, there are two stages of the chain rule. You can simplify it a little bit, because I'm calculating the derivative of j of x of t plus 1 with respect to things at time t. And I could just use lambda for that. So if you look at this and this here, just this part and this part, the bottom and here, what you have is a recurrence relation like the Bellman equation. If you're not discouraged by the complexity, you'll see it's just like the Bellman equation in that we have a value for lambda at time t plus 1 and a rule for telling us what lambda should be at time t. It's a recurrence relation. And we can train a critic to calculate lambda with the same principle we used before for j. We can do it by taking our estimate of lambda at time t plus 1, figuring out what lambda should have been at time t, and using supervised learning to train it. But these calculations look a lot scarier. With HDP, we just added u plus j of t plus 1. It was really easy to calculate the targets. How do we calculate these targets in real time? It turns out to be easier than you might think. This looks like an expensive calculation, order of n cubed, but it's not if we do it the right way. So the next slide, the next to last slide, gives you a flow chart for how we calculate the target for what lambda should be. So let me emphasize. DHP is like HDP. On each iteration, for each time t, we have a value of x, and then we get a value for x at t plus 1. We calculate the lambdas at t plus 1, just like before we had j of t plus 1, and we calculate a target for what lambda of t should be. And then we adapt the critic so that the actual output at time t is close to the target. And we can do that by using least mean squared exactly the way we did before. And I hope you know how to use least mean squares by now, so that if you, have the, if you know the target and you know the output, you know how to adapt the value function or the critic. What you don't know yet is how to calculate that target for what the output of the critic should be. What are we training it to? This flowchart talks about how to calculate that target. The basic idea is, at time t plus 1, we calculate the output of the critic, we just call the critic module, outcome numbers, and we back propagate the derivatives through the model network, through the utility network, through the action network, and that gives us the derivatives we need. I hope you remember the part about dual subroutines when we talked about HDP, we can use dual subroutines to do the backpropagating. So instead of working out all the derivatives by hand on paper, all we have to do, we have a dual subroutine for the model network. We plug in these lambdas, and it outputs what we want. That's all we have to do. We have a dual subroutine for the utility network. We do have to plug in x, and then it outputs the derivatives. We have to add these two together. The most complicated thing we have to do is add the two vectors together. We feed them in to the dual subroutine for the action network, and it works out all the derivatives 
of J of t plus 1 with respect to your actions, and that's what you need to adapt your action network. Okay? So it's not that hard to calculate the target. You just invoke these subroutines. So once you have the dual subroutines, programming up DHP is like a call to these three functions that you've already programmed. So my final slide says all that explicitly in words. You don't need to know the equations, which are intimidating, and you do need more detail than the flowchart. You need the specifics. So the final slide lays out the specifics exactly. This is the algorithm you implement when you implement DHP training of a critic. This is how you do it. On each major iteration, you start with values of x of t, u of t, and x of t plus 1, or a set of such values, just like HTTP. For each value of t in the set, which may be just the current time, maybe you're just learning in real time, you see x, you see x of t plus 1, you adapt. Whatever, wherever you get this t from, the first thing you do is you call the critic network. So you get an estimate of the vector lambda at time t plus 1 by inputting the observed or predicted values for t plus 1 and the weights. Then the next step is you do back propagation by calling the dual subroutines. This is the notation I showed you in the last lecture. It's also in the Handbook of Intelligent Control, Chapter 13. So this indicates you're calling a subroutine, which represents a function. This function has multiple outputs. It has derivatives with respect to weights, with respect to x, but here you take, you use the dual subroutine to give you the derivatives of u with respect to little u, the actions, in that state x. You use the dual subroutine of the model. You plug in as arguments the derivatives from the top. That's part of a dual subroutine, except in this case they usually input derivatives from upstairs to propagate them through. These are the ones you input from upstairs from the critic. You propagate them through and you get the derivatives with respect to you. It's just a function call and all you do is add two numbers and that gives you the derivatives of j of t plus 1 with respect to your actions. But then to get your targets for lambda you have to call dual subroutines again and basically you just call these three dual subroutines, add up the results, there's your target and then, then you're done. This is not a lot of lines of code when you look at it. It's, it's kind of like a, a do loop with you know four additions in it. It's not that hard once you have the dual subroutines. You need to have a computer package with dual subroutines. Finally, just a quick tip. How fast does DHP converge? DHP and backpropagation through time generally converge faster if you start from a final state, like a goal state or a disaster state, and work your way back just like decision trees. If your problem is a little bit like a decision tree in a way, starting from the beginning to the end, like missile interception, you'll find out that if you iterate from the final state to the initial state, you can converge pretty quickly, uh, just as you would in ordinary dynamic programming, where you can work your way back deterministically from an end state if there is a finite end. It, life is more complicated in dynamic programming when it's an infinite time problem, but with a finite time problem, it's like a simple decision tree with no recurrence. You just work your way back. And experience shows if you work your way back, the training tends to be faster. And people sometimes ask, what does that say about human life? Do we start learning only after we get to the goal? Well, in human life, we have something that might be called a simulation ability. Instead of just learning from our present experience X, we can imagine, simulate, or dream a possible state of the world near the goal or near failure, wish fulfillment or nightmare. We have those kind of dreams. What they do is they allow us to train our inner critics to deal with the final goal state so we can kind of propagate back and align our values 
for earlier time periods to reflect the realities of what may be waiting for us in the future. That's important for humans, it's important for efficient learning in machine learning systems. Uh, it's something I described back in 1987 on my paper in Systems Man and Cybernetics. It's something that Richard Sutton describes in a design he called SARSA in the um, book Neural Networks for Control, which cites the earlier work in SMC. So it, it is a very practical tool for some applications when you need to converge faster. And in fact, even in Balakrishna's work, even though everything was in simulation, uh, he found it easier to kind of adapt the critic kind of backwards from the goal state with, with different values for one second from hitting the target and two seconds from hitting the target and, and stuff like that. Um, of course, the other methods for improving convergence that work on HDP can also be applied here. And, uh, and that's the next big thing that we need to work on. Thank you.